The fire that devastated this area has cost us all. And the price tag doesn't just mean dollars. Each year in British Columbia, on the average, more than 60,000 hectares of prime timber are lost to wildfires. That's approximately five times the size of Metro Vancouver. Now, wildfires will never be completely removed as a danger to our society. That's why it's the duty of everyone to see these mobile infernos are identified and controlled. 1985 went on record as one of the worst fire seasons ever. A combination of relentless summer heat, lightning, and human activity. In the Columbia Valley, we didn't lose lives and we didn't lose buildings, but we did spend 18.3 million to save and protect hundreds of millions in lumber sales and nearly 800 million in property. Yes, firefighting does cost us millions of dollars, but wildfires also cost us irreplaceable resources, jobs, and property damage. When wildfires move, they move fast, eating up forests with insatiable appetites. That's when the real battle begins, hand-to-hand -hand combat against weather and time on the fire line. There's a basic formula for fighting wildfires. Find it fast, hit it hard, and go where the need is greatest. And that's when they call in the overhead team. No Ajax pump, three skidders with a uh, tanks on them, and uh, about 25 men. A group of highly experienced personnel, headed by a veteran fire boss, sent in to organize and direct the frontline troops. Earth, fire, and water become major weapons. Shovels and muscle power help the bulldozers construct a fire line to halt the advance of the blade. We use either uh, natural breaks such as uh, roads, uh, rivers, or rock slides, something like that. And we, we time the movement of the fire so that when the fire is in the right position, we burn off from these natural breaks. Where there isn't a natural break, we can construct a fire line. Uh, this can be done in two methods, either by hand with men, or else we can do it with equipment such as cats. We try to build, judge the speed the fire is going, and then build the fire line in a sufficient distance from the fire that when the timing is, is right and it's appropriate, we can uh, light up off the fire guard and burn quietly back at our own pace back to the main fire, and that way establish a fire line. Meanwhile, firefighters armed with axes, mattocks, chainsaws, pumps, and hoses attack the rear and flanks of the fire, eventually gaining the upper hand. Despite the high-tech aspect of wildfire fighting, it's the man on the ground, the individual on the fire line, that is still the first line of defense. More than 7,000 men and women in BC have had some level of firefighting training. All training and recruitment is done at the district level. Over the years, BC has become a world leader in fighting wildfires. Countries like the United States and Australia have used BC-developed firefighting techniques. Although the terrain may differ, the problems remain the same. No matter the locale, the war against wildfires is fought with military precision. The secret of firefighting success is fast initial attack, controlling the fire before it can spread. About 450 people, in crews of 3 to 20, strategically located throughout the province during the high-risk season, wait for the call. Despite the high success rate and the fast response strategy, most summers have their share of big wildfires or project fires. And that's when the second line of defense is called in from a reserve of several thousand ground support troops. In the all-out war against major wildfires, the initial attack comes from the sky, from aerial teams known as rap attack. Environmental SWAT teams repel 200 feet from a hovering helicopter to the base of the fire. Heroic? Glamorous? Not on your life. To these men, it's just a job they want to get on with. Rap attack training rivals army boot camp. 
To be part of the team means you are fit. Out of thousands of applicants who think they can handle the job, only a small percentage actually make the grade. They come from all walks of life. Most are university students. And although physical fitness plays a very important role, being able to function under severe stress is equally important. In the heat of the fire, the decision you make has to be the right one. One of the most important firefighting tools is the aircraft, water tankers which can deliver tons of water to a fire site. But hundreds of tons of fire retardant are also used to control a fire. Without the airplane, this task would be virtually impossible. British Columbia is fortunate to have a world leader in wildfire bombing located in the heart of the province. Con Air has constantly led the way in developing new and innovative aircraft and methods of wildfire suppression. With more than 50 aircraft at their disposal, Con Air crews could answer the call in any situation. When I was uh, first started flying and I was uh, at the bottom of a canyon and the smoke started, it was a strong wind and the smoke filled the whole canyon and I had to literally find, fly blind uh, very low to the trees for about uh, what was probably 10, 15 seconds. It seemed to me a lot longer trying to find my way out, but it was a very, very frightening situation, one that I uh, do my best uh, I, to avoid. I, I never want to get into a situation quite like that again. Our main uh, purpose is to slow down the rate of spread of the fire, and, and therefore we try and drop outside the fire perimeter. If we drop uh, retardant inside the fire, we're actually wasting our retardant. So uh, if we're dropping properly, we are uh, on the outside of the flames. And the, we don't actually put out the fire. We're there to just simply to slow it down uh, until the ground crew get in there. They're still the people who put the fire out. It is the front line where all the action takes place, the muscle and the machines that push back the flames. But like all strategic operations, headquarters is essential to coordinate the fighting forces. Here at the Fire Control Center in Victoria, the big picture is available at a glance. Fire movement is plotted and recorded. Air attack decisions are made. Firefighting strategies are discussed and mapped out. While the fire line remains the place for final decisions, headquarters through regional fire control centers is in constant touch with the front line of defense. The uh, major responsibilities of the fire control center are uh, mainly to monitor the activities in the field, things such as weather, the amount of fire starts we have, the prediction of uh, lightning or other causes, and uh, provide resources to back up and uh, sustain the field people with in the event they need them. On the national scene, we have uh, gone into agreement uh, with CIFSI, or the Canadian Interagency Fire Center, which was established to allow for uh, borrowing, loaning of resources uh, if somebody should get into trouble. Obviously, nobody could afford to uh, have the resources around in the worst fire scenario, so uh, we can share. If the initial attack crews fail to contain a fire, the call is made to control center for major assistance. Some of the larger fires can require as many as 600 firefighters, two dozen crawler tractors, buses for transportation, tank trucks, helicopters, skidders, and, of course, the inevitable camp facilities for feeding and housing the fire crews. How was it? Good. Good? Super supper. Super supper. It is said that an army travels on its stomach. Well, that is also the case for the army of men and women required to fight the wildfire. The problems of providing accommodation and food for hundreds of people at a time are dealt with here at the Ministry of Forest Surrey Warehouse, and at five other locations throughout the province. When the call goes out, it's from centers like these that the equipment is provided for the canvas communities that spring up near a fire site. Arrangements are also made for equipment and other necessities for the front line. In most situations, all food is bought on site from local suppliers. Keeping the men happy isn't only a question of good food. A gentle hand and a reassuring word go a long way to make the 18-hour days a little more tolerable. I make sure they eat. And if they're tired, I, like my staff, I send them off to go sleep because uh, if, you, if you act like a mom, they'll treat you like a mom, they love you, 
They respect you. Now she makes a little slice of home here. It's good meals. We all got something to look forward to when we come home after a long day like today. Eh? Our forests are one of BC's greatest natural resources. Either directly or indirectly, the forest industry employs approximately one-fifth or 20% of BC's labor force, producing almost $9 billion of timber revenue each year. One of the Ministry of Forest's primary roles is to protect the forest, and ideally it doesn't want to spend more money to suppress a fire than the endangered timber is worth. But when people's lives and homes are at stake, timber values and cost considerations take a back seat. Early detection of wildfires is half the battle. In each of BC's six regions, there are assigned districts, each with its share of fire lookouts, ground patrols, air patrols with infrared scanning equipment, and computerized lightning detection systems. But by far, the Forest Service's best tool for fire detection is the sharp eye of the public. 80% of wildfires are brought under control by 10 a.m. the next day, largely because of accurate reporting and early detection. The general public is credited with reporting one-third of all new fires, more than air patrols, forest industry workers, or any other single source. If you see a forest fire, please pay attention. Accurate reporting is vital. Note the exact location, the color and density, the volume of smoke, the wind speed and its direction, the type of trees and the approximate size of the fire. Then report it immediately to the nearest Forest Service office or use the toll-free telephone line, dial zero, and ask for Zenith 5555. So when you're on your next hiking trail, camping trip, or leisure drive through beautiful BC, be on the lookout for wildfire and be doubly sure that the fire doesn't start with you. It's no coincidence that the peak forest fire season and that time of year when our forests reach their maximum potential for use come at the same time. It only stands to reason that when man extends his boundaries to include the great outdoors, the risk of human error is also extended. The chances of wildfire starting due to a campfire left unattended, a cigarette butt casually tossed from a passing car, or a spark from heavy industrial equipment are very real. In fact, over 50% of all forest fires are caused either directly or indirectly by people. Well, the public utilize the forest lands quite extensively for recreational usage. And I think one of the main things that they can do to help bring the incidents of wildfire fires caused by the public is to utilize uh, developed campsites and monitor their campfires closely ensuring that the campfires have been extinguished and are not left unattended. There are some regulations in areas of the province where campfire bans are on, and the public should be aware of these and follow them strictly because uh, that's a very serious problem if they start campfires uh, during the heavy fire season. You might be surprised to know that on an average, there are about 2,500 wildfires every year in BC. Fortunately, most of them are dealt with quickly, not too many of them have a chance to become big. So why do some wildfires defy initial attack? How do fires get out of control? Winds, weather, and pre-season fuel conditions have a lot to do with it. If it's a dry winter with little snowfall and no rain in the month of June, we're headed for a red alert summer. Such was the case in 1985, when fire made its claim on forest after forest in the stifling heat of a timber drying sun. Between June and September, the Columbia Valley had its share of evacuations, emergencies, and fear. At the height of the crisis, criticism was flying in all directions as people demanded to know why and how fire could threaten them. Disbelief at the audacity of the flames to climb out of the hills and toward their homes. The, the wind and everything is in our favor right now, and we're just moving every piece of iron we can get in front of that fire, and, and we're, we're going to stop it today if we get any break at all. According to District Manager Jack Caradice, on the fire line, it's always a case of making judgment calls. Firefighting is rather a beautiful thing, because uh, as soon as you make a decision on a fire and implement that decision, you get instant feedback. You're either right or you're wrong, 
And if you're wrong, not only you know it, but probably the whole world knows it. So, yeah, judgment calls on fires uh, are sort of interesting. Um, when, when I think back on what happened last summer and some of the judgment calls that had to be made, there, there were just all sorts of things that uh, had to be considered. Um, as um, everybody knows, we had the evacuation situations in Canal Flats and at North Bend and other areas of the province. Um, evacuation situations um, are pretty heavy-duty kind of decisions to make. But there were a lot of other decisions made, too. Deci decisions such as uh, when to backfire, where you're going to put the torch to hundreds of acres of valuable merchantable timber. Uh, you don't do that lightly. Uh, probably one of the, I think probably one of the most uh, difficult decisions of that type that uh, I was involved in making was in burning a plantation. And uh, I can remember getting out of the helicopter and walking through this area and, and feeling the little trees and, and looking at them and thinking the only way we can uh, stop the fire coming through this particular area is to put the torch to these trees. And uh, that was one of the situations where I think I had tears in my eyes because, you know, these plantations are pretty, pretty valuable to us. Despite the costs incurred for fighting the fires and the inconvenience incurred by people who were forced to evacuate, residents of the Columbia Valley were lucky in comparison to the town of Fireside near the Yukon border. In 1982, unexpected winds of 45 miles per hour pushed the egg fire 18 miles in a matter of hours. The little village didn't have a chance. When it swept over Fireside, the wall of flame was over 600 feet high. Residents were safely evacuated, but when they returned the next day, everything was gone. Wildfires can and often do take on a life of their own. The amount of dryness in the fuel available to the flames, the wind, and the terrain all contribute to the behavior of a fire. Winds can reach speeds in excess of 100 kilometers an hour in a firestorm. As the superheated air soars above the flames, cooler air rushes in to take its place. The end result is a tornado effect, and the fire has created its own environment. Flames leaping from tree to tree, and heat so intense it can dry out the forest for miles ahead of the fire and actually cause dry timber to suddenly burst into flames. Larger fires can affect the weather for several square miles. When this happens, crews have their hands full simply trying to contain the fire, that is to keep it in one place. A fire which has been contained is one which crews have managed to stop from moving. This is done by creating a situation in which there is no longer fuel for the flames to feed on. Fuel is removed by applying water and fire retardants, both from the air and on the ground. This cools down the fire and prevents its spread so control lines can be built. In some cases, firefighters actually fight fire with fire, setting backburns, which effectively destroy the fuel in the main fire's path. Modern technology has provided several methods of lighting the backburn. Specially equipped helicopters drop ping pong balls from several hundred feet and chemicals inside the balls mix causing an incendiary effect within seconds. Several hundred hectares can be ignited at a time using this method. Once the backburn is set and the fuel removed, the fire is said to be under control. Now it will simply burn itself out, and crews can move in and begin the mopping up phase. When city noise and city heat start to take their toll, the spirit longs for the tranquility of the country and the simple life. Everyone dreams of the great getaway, and in the past few years, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of subdivisions and developments in forested areas. While most people realize that fire is one of nature's rebalancing acts, what they don't realize is that most BC forests have experienced fire in the past 200 years. And there's no reason to think that these areas are now immune to future fires. It is absolutely essential that the subdivider, developer, or individual forest home builder include fire safety and suppression measures in their planning. Forest subdivisions and private residences are outside the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Forests, and in any case, 
Structural firefighting requires a response time of less than 10 minutes with access to large volumes of water under high pressure. It becomes quite obvious that the best method for fighting structural fires in the forest is with prevention. In the world of wildfire fighting, they have a saying, you can light them now or fight them later. Now this pertains to what is called prescribed or controlled burns. In recent years, forest, range, and wildlife managers have been using fire as a land management tool. Prescribed fires can assist forest growth as well as create a better living environment for wildlife. Prescribed fires are used in everyday life. You burn your leaves, farmers burn to clear their land, and land managers burn to remove potential fuel from the bed of a forest or to prepare an area for the next crop after it has been logged. As a silviculture tool, prescribed burning is generally preferable to machinery in preparing a site for planting. Burning speeds up the return of nutrients to the soil. It opens up access to the ground for tree planters. It exposes mineral soil, making it easier for seedlings to get established. And it helps to keep down weeds and other competing vegetation long enough for seedlings to get a good start on life. Here, at a private sector nursery, natural and genetically developed seedlings are being nurtured and prepared for planting. Some of these seedlings may not be marketable as timber for another 50 to 100 years. Clearly, the business of reforestation is a job for the steadfast and the patient. We've uh, initially uh, designed this greenhouse to, as a, as our, as a nurseryman, we, we try to alleviate all the stresses on, a, on the stock in order to optimize the genetic potential of the stock. And in order to do that, we have to create as, as good an environment as possible. Uh, we use a computer that controls the entire greenhouse, everything from heating, venting, uh, CO2 dosing, uh, turning on and off of lights. Uh, all aspects of crop management are controlled by one central computer. Uh, we do this uh, because we're, we're trying to produce as best a stock as possible in the shortest period of time. There are many, many functions that occur inside the greenhouse that uh, many people aren't aware of. For example, uh, uh, all, all trees and, and plants, for that matter, register the time of season by the length of the night. So we do crop manipulation with, with uh, high-pressure sodium lights and uh, blackout curtains uh, at various times of the year in order to induce, induce dormancy. Um, as well, uh, fertilizing, pH control, concentrations of fertilizer, all these aspects are, are coordinated by the, by the computer and uh, under our command. Over 200 million seedlings are planted every year in coastal and interior forests, creating a patchwork plan of different age tree stands and a balanced habitat for wildlife. In 10 years, the forest begins to take shape. In many decades, it will again be ready for harvest. Five years ago, this stand of trees was a reforestation project. Sixty years from now, many of these trees will be ready for harvest. A never-ending cycle of harvesting and reforestation to ensure the future of our forests. And now, the federal government has reached agreement with the province to guarantee BC can continue to provide high-grade timber and wood products to the rest of the world. An agreement was entered into between the uh, federal government and all provinces. As far as British Columbia is concerned, it represented an, an expenditure of $300 million over five years, which is divided equally between our government, for the province of British Columbia, and the federal government. It's for in, a reforestation to look after primarily areas where there is a, a great deal of backlog work to be done. Backlog work simply means <clears throat> work where there has not been actual planting of seeds. And there are, there are several hundred thousand hectares in British Columbia that need attention. The purpose of the uh, federal uh, provincial agreement is to replant those, those lands which have been harvested and have not, have, have not really uh, been restocked. If we don't maintain that, it's going to affect the annual cut. Now, believe me, the people in the, uh, in the logging and the lumber industry knows, know what that means. If you do not uh, reforest, the annual cut will then shrink. And there's been a great deal of talk recently about this. That agreement, uh, together with the uh, significant increase in the Ministry of Forest 
uh, budget this year, a lift of 21 percent, is going to is going to be a, cons a great help uh, province-wide. And uh, I think there is no reason why we cannot, uh, over a period of time, it'll probably take about 10 years to adequately replant the harvested land. Mr. Heinrich, last year's severe forest fire season is still being talked about around the province. Have there been any changes in tactics in terms of attacking wildfires in British Columbia as a result of last year's severe season? Last year was a, was a, was a very difficult year. Dry spills were extended. Lightning attacks were, uh, were uh, very, very frequent. For this coming year, uh, we've, uh, we've improved our communications. Uh, that is without question. Improved coordination with industry, and that has been done. Improved the technology for the purposes of citing uh, fires and reporting them. Rapid attack system has been increased. I think we must keep in mind as well that the Forest Service and those who fought the fires last year did an extraordinary job under the, under the most uh, severe, probably, conditions for fire suppression that we had ever really encountered. There have been greater losses in British Columbia in the past, as uh, those who were involved in the Forest Service uh, are very much aware. But the number of fires which occurred last year was really attributable to the uh, very, very dry spell. It was an unusual year. We've all learned something from it, and, uh, and I believe that the system will be uh, improved for 1986. squads to the crews on the fire line. Firefighting in British Columbia is a provincial priority. Wildfires are battles we can't afford to lose. There is no glamour in being a firefighter. The hours are relentless and the danger is real. But it's a job that must be done. We can all help in the fight against fire. Each and every one of us. From the recreational camper who puts out the campfire to the alert traveler who spots a wildfire. In a very real way, we are all on the fire line.